Welcome to Dinner and a Movie with Santino Damani, the channel dedicated to reviving the lost art of bringing people together through good food and good film. I'm Santino and today I'll be going over how to make an outstanding Italian wedding style meatball soup that for countless generations has been warming hearts and stomachs and painting the toilet bowls of newly wedded Italian couples the morning after their sacred unions. Along with it, I'm going to recommend a movie I think you might like while you're enjoying the fruits of your culinary efforts. Not only do I consider it to contain what might be the most underappreciated performance of Al Pacino's illustrious career, it touches on some compelling themes and insights that are perhaps as relevant today as they were in 1979 when the film was released, or as they ever have been for that matter. That movie is Injustice for All. Let's get after it, shall we? Before we start tearing into the film, I'll go ahead and give the soup a quick rundown. And while I'm jawing on, I'll post a list of the ingredients, the directions, and some B-roll of me putting it together, while taking care to interject notes and commentary here and there where I think it might be appropriate. And if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments section. I'll do my best to get them answered. So I suppose I should say first that I don't consider this dish to be particularly taxing to put together, especially if you've spent half your life wanking a Parmesan cheese grater like I have. I've heard people say that too much of anything is not good for you, baby. But I don't know about that. But if trying to make new friends as a kid, smelling like what could only be either really good cheese or the combination of ass feet and corn chips isn't an experience you've had to try and communicate to a psychotherapist at some point in your life. Oh yes, I've had some smelly ones before. But your son is by far the smelliest. Rolling about a pound or so of ground meat is probably going to be the most harrowing of your endeavors here. But to be honest, even that can serve as an opportunity for merriment if you can sucker your family or friends to get in on the act with you. As has been the case for my family for as long as I can remember. I've been at it for the better part of three decades now, and every session rekindles my awe at the seemingly bottomless cornucopia of ball handling jokes to draw from. Larry Bird doesn't do as much ball handling in one night as you do in an hour. I also like this recipe because there's a couple of variations that can make the soup a bit more accessible without sacrificing too much of the flavor as it would otherwise be with the original ingredients. Or you can even make it a bit more substantive, should you care to offer it as more of a main course as opposed to a starter, as it's been traditionally offered in the past. Speaking of which, as a main dish, this is going to serve anywhere from around four to six people. And as an appetizer, or what we olive oil enthusiasts like to call antipasto, you're looking at keeping six to 10 people happy. Alright, so considering this is my first go at things, I think it would be the gentlemanly thing to do to expand upon what it is exactly I'm hoping to accomplish here. Well, for as long as I can remember, there's been no greater passions of mine than my family and my friends. And it's certainly been my experience that nothing brings them together quite like good food and good entertainment. So if you're trying to make more of an effort to have a good time with your friends, it doesn't involve you dropping a C note or two or three at the bar every other weekend. Or if you're looking to spend more time with your family, but often find yourself at the mercy of whatever bile is being spouted from the boomer box. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better. And it might even block a, a droplet but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think that it is. And often, there are unintended consequences. People keep fiddling with the mask and they keep touching their face. 
And can you get some schmutz sort of staying inside there? Of course, of course. Or if you're just looking to expand the ammunition at your disposal in your dating arsenal, but your culinary and cinematic dexterity leave much to be desired, then, well... It's not always I'm fucked. In so many words, yes. And the way I see it, if there's something I can do for my fellow man to help ease his suffering, well, I'd like to take a shot at it. I took a shot. Want to do something here? What am I gonna say? Took a shot. Nice try, son. In terms of my qualifications, well, let's just say I've been around the block a time or two. And the good Lord has blessed me with the intuition to know when it's probably a good idea to hang around and keep my eyes and ears open. In other words, I've seen things. Like this one time at the Cape when I saw this guy try and put on a pair of pants like they were a cardigan. <laughs> I've even witnessed a grown man play a pastrami sandwich in front of Richie Havens, Peter Noon, and Robbie Krieger. <laughs> and countless such invaluable life experiences have afforded me the opportunity to become quite knowledgeable in some uniquely specific areas of life. And if there's anything I've become especially knowledgeable about over the years, it's part Parking my fat ass in front of a screen, piling food into my face, and passing judgments on other people's hard work like some sort of half ass Caligula. Well, at any rate, like my mom always used to say, if you have a gift, share it with the world. Actually, what she always used to say was, I don't know how the hell you got a hold of my VCR this time, you son of a bitch, but I swear by God and Sonny Jesus, this is the last time I'm buying it back from Baba Giovanni's middle. What kind of sick animal does this to his own mother anyway? You rat bastard, I hate you. I never wanted anything to do with you. You're the reason why it never worked out between me and your father. All right, I'll see you at church, son. Give my best to Janine. And here's a sawbuck. Go get a sandwich. You look hungry. But I digress. As far as movies go, I'm going to throw out some recommendations that I think you people might like, or that I feel are generally underrated, or perhaps not as well known as I think they should be. I'll go and explain why it is I think they're worth mentioning, or why I think you might like them. And I'll even try and cover some of the more nuanced elements of the film, like theme. Fredo, you're my older brother, and I love you. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. And symbolism. At least get rid of the glasses. I can't think of a single man in the Bureau who wears them. In God save us, we might even explore some of the more philosophical and generally existential implications that might come from the film. And that's not to say that I'm claiming to know everything, or anything really for that matter, but damned if I don't think they're fun to discuss within the context of a specific film. And I genuinely hope we can have some good times together in that regard, having insightful, good faith discussions about who we, as human beings, really are. <laughs> we've come from. <laughs> and where we, with our limitless imagination and lust for discovery, are going. Perhaps most importantly, the implications regarding our place in the universe and our moral obligations to it, as well as to each other. Now, if this is the first time watching whatever film it is I'm reviewing, I'm going to do my best to keep it fresh and not ruin the experience for you. I'll go over some of the pillar beats and sketch out a rough frame of the film so you can get a bit of an idea of what it is exactly I'm getting you into before you decide whether or not you actually want to get into it. Suffice it to say, I'm going to be going over some plot points and analyzing performances and storytelling elements that are going to more than likely, well, 
spoil some parts of the film a bit so if you'd rather go check it out first and then come back to see how on point your old Paisan Santino was I think you could do that and still get something out of this channel and I certainly wouldn't give you any static over it either way if you would be so good as to let me know how I'm doing in the comments that'll give me a better idea of how to fine-tune the channel so I can give you a better viewing experience or a better idea of whether or not I actually have any creative talent at all. And as such, my time wouldn't be better served concocting new and innovative ways to boost my mother's VCR, to fence for Skittles and grape drink money. Alright, enough of that. Take a deep breath and make yourself square with the Almighty. We're going in, Paisan. I ain't your Paisano. And if we come back, we're not coming back the same as we were. Oh, hey, and here's the human parasite hybrid that protrudes from my chest, not unlike, but legally distinguishable from, Quanto from Paul Verhoeven's Total Recall. He likes to crack eggs, and I promise him he can if he promises to keep quiet in the bedroom. He's all right. We have fun together. But at any rate, back to the film. The year is 1979. And if you can believe it, entitled dead-headed musicians like Neil Young are actually condemning authoritarianism, as opposed to threatening to withhold their intellectual property from the proletariat in an effort to defend the government's self-evident right to censor any of their dissenting opinions. This land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, no trespassing this land. The fact is, the late 70s and early 80s in the States were nothing less than a crab bucket of strife, anxiety, and narcotics. Lots and lots of narcotics. That is to say, the United States was on the ropes, shucking and jiving, punch drunk from an onslaught of devastating socioeconomic haymakers at the hands of an incompetent president who seemed hell-bent on plowing the country straight into the casting couch. A massive drug problem was sweeping through the country like some sort of plague. Gas prices were through the roof, and inflation was out of control with seemingly no end in sight. Tensions with Russia were as high as they'd ever been, and thanks to the fear-mongering rhetoric at the hands of opportunistic career politicians and media info entertainment outlets, sitting at number one on everyone's top 10 list of issues to shit the bed over, a new terrifying virus had generated an unprecedented hysteria, which swept through the country like some sort of massive drug problem. Faithful listeners, I submit this question to you. Can you even hypothesize such a bleak and abysmal state of affairs coming to pass in the progressive and forward-thinking current year we find ourselves presently occupying? If at all possible, gentle viewer, suspend your disbelief for a moment and try your best to abstract such an abysmal and unlikely likely scenario and take yourself back to the city of Baltimore circa 1979 where corruption and bureaucracy were bearing down upon the criminal justice system like a shotgun full of corruption and bureaucracy that wasn't mine that was Mike Scully's hashtag rest in power hashtag only the good die hung and I don't mean at the end of a rope if you know what I'm saying thoughts and prayers in the comments section please Mike the commemorative sticker shipped yesterday fam it'll be on the back window of the Astro van by Saturday at any rate such was the sorry state of outside affairs when an unsuspecting John Q everyman staggered into a feculent Los Angeles movie theater one warm September evening in 1979 to video director Norman Juice in satirical courtroom drama and justice for all much to his chagrin the atmosphere would feel familiar to him, cold, cramped, uncaring, and busy. And it's against this backdrop that we follow disenchanted Baltimore criminal defense attorney Arthur Kirkland, played by Captain Outrage himself, Al Pacino. I apologize, but we have to do a stop here. So I can address an issue with the meal. I hate to kill the momentum, but I'm afraid it's necessary. As of late, there's been a disgusting rumor floating around the popular mainstream Italian soup and chowder enthusiast circuit, like a nutty turd in a crystal punch bowl, that just using regular Parmesan, whatever the hell that might be anyway, or substituting Asiago or even more Pecorino Romano in place of the Parmigiano Reggiano will produce a different, less palatable flavor has been debunked. <laughs> And it's just an old wives' tale that no talent bad boy amateur chefs have kept alive to look more savvy and knowledgeable than they actually are. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to rebonk it. Can you substitute Reggiano for Asiago or even Romano? Oh no, never, never. Why not? Against the rules. 
You know, you're stupid when you do that. Just some English pig with no I brain guess, at all, um, you know? Now, I understand that for some people, getting Parmigiano-Reggiano might be a bit more difficult in terms of effort or expense or both. And we're not even going to condescend and swear to everybody watching this that the extra effort or money is totally going to be worth it, dude. Like, you don't even know, dude. What I can guarantee you, however, is that this ingredient adds such an extremely unique texture and taste to this dish that to substitute it with something else is going to fundamentally change the dish itself. Now, since there's nobody I hate more than the postmodern artist who won't explain, read, can't explain his or her quote unquote work and whose success relies exclusively on the insecurities of sycophants desperate for the attention and affirmation of their social superiors. I'm going to take just a quick moment to defend my position with some information about the difference between these cheeses that, if I had to guess, probably isn't knowledge that's all that common. As is the case with many popular foods, much of what makes them unique is not only how they're created, but where they're created. Some pretty common examples include Malbec wines from Argentina, San Marzano tomatoes from Italy, and cigars made with tobacco leaves grown in Cuba. Sergeant, you get that contraband stogie out of my face. Before I shove it so far up your ass, you'll have to set fire your nose to light it. And in order for many companies to be able to attach the popular label to their products, they have to follow extremely strict geographic boundary and production guidelines that conform to protected designation of origin statutes under European Union law. And in order for a cheese to have the label Parmigiano Reggiano, or what many of the locals call the king of cheeses, it has to conform to some of the strictest guidelines, frankly, because the cheese is that damn distinguishable and, well, good. Now, I know what you're thinking. Not only is all that really uninteresting, it also sounds really expensive. Well, in fact, depending on where you're at, you're looking at spending around 2 to $3 more than you would on the Pecorino Romano. And I'm not going to say that's nothing. Believe me, I know just as well as anyone that an extra 7 or $8 for some cheese, when you've already spent $4 on another particular kind of cheese, is not nothing in terms of expense, especially these days. So if skipping the Reggiano is something you have to do to get this dish put together, or even something you just want to do, I'm not going to tell you that the soup won't even taste good. But for the sake of transparency, I do have to say that you will, effectively, be getting a different dish. There. Now we can be friends again. Well, at any rate, back to the film. It's not long after a series of technical oversights that result in some serious disproportionate consequences for some of his clients, an already overworked and overwhelmed Kirkland falls into disfavor with a particularly cantankerous and by-the-numbers judge, Henry T. Fleming. And by falls in disfavor with, I mean is held in contempt of court for assaulting him. And just in case it wasn't clear to anybody in the audience, You don't threaten a judge. You don't threaten a judge! Everybody got that? All right, let's move on. Yes, that's Jeffrey Tambor, by the way, a very young Jeffrey Tambor. The same Jeffrey Tambor from, well, goddamned everything, actually, ranging from the Bubble Guppies and Batman the Animated Series to There's Something About Mary in Three O'Clock High and just about everywhere else in between. But most of us grunts probably know him best for playing Papa Bluth in the 2003 hit series Arrested Development. I said to the teacher, I said, you poison her, I'll poison you. George Sr. did more than just say it. He sent the man a basket of poison muffins. Do you know the Muffin Man? There's a reward in it if you do. A couple of B stories help to shed some light on who Arthur is, where he's come from, and what his motivations are. One such relationship is with his grandfather, portrayed by Lee Strasberg, who, by the by, just so happens to play opposite Pacino as Hyman Roth in The Godfather Part Two. Surreal is the only word I could really think to use to depict such a dramatic shift in a dynamic between two actors working at such completely different roles. I think anyone with even a passing interest in acting or movies in general can appreciate the range of these two talented actors simply by contrasting the two performances. And I have to be honest and say that that might be one of the reasons why I have such a special place in my heart for this film. Oh, something's wrong when it's breaks, Gary! Now actually taking the time to weigh each meatball isn't really necessary. In fact, it's usually something I catch a bunch of shit for. But the way I see it, if someone is good enough to afford me the opportunity to put my balls in their mouth, I think the extra time I put into making them smooth and consistent is a simple courtesy. It's usually well received and generally appreciated. Oh! <laughs> 
At any rate, Kirkland, who was essentially disregarded and abandoned by his biological parents at a tender age, seems to have developed an inclination for helping those he perceives to be disadvantaged or generally dejected by an indifferent and unjust society around him. This comes at the behest of his grandfather, a man in the twilight of his life who finds meaning and purpose through his grandson's successes, because Arthur's success in law school could be largely attributed to him. He insists to Arthur that a man without integrity is no man at all, and as time goes on, Kirkland finds himself struggling more and more to reconcile what he perceives to be his ethical duty to his grandfather, as well as to society in general, and his ethical duty to a more dispassionate but objective legal process, which does its best but seems to be perpetually falling short for him and his clients. Kirkland vents these frustrations while being questioned by an ethics committee that's clearly more concerned with demonstrating its relevance and flexing its muscle than it is with actually trying to root out and eliminate corruption within the troubled justice system. Annoyed, but very much intrigued, by Kirkland's irreverence towards the committee which he holds in such high esteem, one of the committee members, Gail Packer, confronts him shortly after the hearing to take him to task for his indignant behavior. But hypocrisy wins the day when Packer, again a member of the Ethics Committee, agrees to go on a date with Kirkland, who, again, is the subject of an investigation under the Ethics Committee. And I think it's appropriate here to highlight this as an example of disciplined and well-managed storytelling. Unlike other parts of the story I'll be griping about later, the irony here that is, a member of the Ethics Committee who's almost entirely up her own ass about its moral indispensability, seeing absolutely nothing wrong with sleeping with someone being investigated by that same committee, isn't beaten over your head. The film gives its audience a little credit and lets the merits of the good storytelling do most of the walking. We get an even better understanding of the kind of man Kirkland is when we see him introduced to a new client. Ralph Aggie. A particular individual in jail. Kirkland is a man who's very clearly come to the end of his rope as a criminal defense attorney. Quite obviously strives to be a benevolent man, defending his clients vigorously, regardless of the personal cost of doing so. But he's also clearly stern and seasoned, making it expressly clear that he has no time to waste defending clients who refuse to be straightforward with him. Now either you give me some straight answers or you get yourself another lawyer. I don't have time to listen to some jive ass. Put me on. The exchange between the two of them during their first meeting is engaging without question, and taking care not to drop any spoilers, I can say with the utmost sincerity that how the relationship between the two of them plays out is among the most compelling and unabashedly human I've seen in any film, really. For my part, the thread ends with one of the most passionate and genuine performances by Pacino there is, and I have to say, he really puts it out there for this one, and by gumption, it comes forward. God damn it! Oh, I'm sorry! I... Kirkland continues to petition the hated Judge Fleming to allow evidence into the court's consideration that would exonerate his client, but Fleming, who could allow it but is not bound by law to do so, essentially tells Kirkland to go fuck his mother. Innocent or not of whatever crime he's been accused, his client is, in fact, right at home where he belongs, in the bullpen, up to his tits, in piss, vomit, and sexual assault. But it's not long before the shoe up and fucks the other foot, and the judge finds himself in a wee spot of bother when a young woman comes forward, accusing him of brutally beating and raping her. Make Making matters worse, the reputation he's built up over the years as a hard-nosed, by-the-book judge, coupled with the fact that his alleged victim appears to have no motive to falsely accuse him, makes it increasingly difficult for him to find any counsel willing to defend him. When an advisor comes up with the idea that the legal community and general public might be more inclined to believe in his innocence, should Fleming be represented by an attorney who reputedly despises the man, but despises injustice even more, a solution presents itself in the form of a disgruntled, but ever-benevolent Arthur Kirkland, who promptly tells the judge to go fuck his mother. An indignant Fleming lashes out, insisting on his innocence, but Arthur's like, What are you doing here? I thought I'd tell you to go fuck your mother. <laughs> Enter Judge Francis Rayford, played by the ever-charismatic and just delightful Jack Warden, who you may remember from such films as Mr. Peepers and The Man Who Loved Cat Dancing. Judge Rayford and Arthur Kirkland are sort of friends, you see, and after it's come to Rayford's attention that Kirkland is refusing to defend Fleming, Rayford informs him in confidence that he himself has inside knowledge that Kirkland's refusal to defend the accused judge will cost him his license to practice law, and, ultimately, his career that seems to have bonded him and his grandfather so tightly. Now, if you're familiar with Blake Snyder's BS2, a tool many writers use to flesh out major plot points of their story, Dude, no promo, by the way. I'd say that just about gets us to the midpoint beat of the film. I think it would be a good idea to leave it there, because going into much detail from there about how the story resolves would be doing you a tremendous disservice. Suffice it to say, bad guys close in, on many different levels as a matter of fact, with a number of characters, and in both a physical and emotional sense, all that was is lost, and lessons are won through the short, long road of sacrifice. 
And for my part, what follows is a resolution that should stir something up inside of you about the implications of humanity, humility, and how they intertwine with moral authority. I know it sure did for me. And if not, I hope you got the opportunity to lay back, relax, and relish in some of that sweet, sweet Pacino indignation. And Justice for All is a story very clearly of the institutionalized caliber, where the institution slowly closes in on the only character in the story who seems to actually recognize the madhouse around them, as well as the horrors it's subjecting them to. This persists until he's made to break, either for the good by lifting the veil and revealing the institution to the oblivious institutionalized by sacrificing himself on the altar of dissent. This is a $4,000 sofa upholstered in Italian silk. This is not just a couch. It's just a couch! Or for the tragic, by snapping and finally learning to stop worrying and love the bomb. You mentioned the uh, ratio of uh, ten women to each man. Uh, uh, wouldn't that necessitate the abandonment of the so-called uh, monogamous sexual relationship? I mean, uh, as far as men were concerned. Uh, regrettably, yes. But it is, you know, a sacrifice required for the future of the human race. I must confess, you have an astonishingly good idea there, Doctor. Or to stop worrying and love Big Brother. By a vote of seven to four, Nick, you are evicted from the Big Brother house. Please, please don't let anybody convince you that you're a stooge for using bouillon instead of liquid chicken stock or broth. This is what I use, no promo. And not only has no one complained since I switched, people I've cooked it for in the past have almost unanimously agreed that they like it even better. And the best part is you don't have to sell a kidney in order to be able to afford what's essentially chicken-flavored water. Now, where was I? Let me tell you something, this film might be the most outrageous blend of irreverent shtick and serious drama perhaps there ever was. And the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that this movie could not have been made at any other point in human history, nor could I see something like it being put together in the near future. I mean, this movie was made during what could arguably be considered Hollywood's peak period of both degeneracy and creativity. Writers back then were pounding pints of vodka in a sitting, shoving eight balls up whatever orifice was most readily accessible every 20 minutes, and writing films like Heavy Metal, Alien, Mad Max, Apocalypse Now, and 1941. Writers today are chugging soy milk and snorting Cheeto dust in what very few people could dispute as Hollywood's peak period of entitlement and victimhood. And what do we have to show for it? Gorgeousness and gorgeousity made flesh. As I slew shit, I knew such lovely pictures. Alright, I apologize, but we have to make another stab here. Uh, a wiser man than myself, whose name I naturally can't remember, once said that texture is flavor. And for better or worse, if you're gonna substitute the escarole for kale, as I'm doing here because I assume that the majority of people watching this might not have access to it, the texture is going to be different. But after cooking the kale for about 30 to 40 minutes, the taste is going to be remarkably similar. Proceed, sir. And it should also be noted that this film received two Academy Award nods back when receiving an Academy Award nomination was reflective of the character and merits of the work. 
as opposed to a pitiful scrap tossed from the table of our cultural and political superiors in an effort to affirm and award supplication to the will of the party. Pacino got one for the best leading actor, of course, and the other went to writers Houston and Patrick Palmer for best original screenplay. As far as theme goes, the film isn't exactly subtle when it comes to pointing out the potential for abuse from those with the most power within America's criminal justice system, nor does it shy away from rubbing your nose in the face of the all too real ramifications of such abuses. You are also a revolting, despicable scum of the earth who should be taken out and squashed like a cockroach. Judge Fleming, I object. My client has not been found guilty yet. Make no mistake, as cartoonishly evil as the character of Judge Fleming may appear to be to the uninitiated, speaking as someone whose father has worked extensively within California's abysmal court system, arguably the most corrupt in the country, Fleming is by no means a black swan. But, having said that, I'm sure you know that there's no shortage of films that have no trouble portraying the criminal justice system as this overbearing force that serves no other purpose than to crush the neck of the most susceptible in our society. There seems to be a curious commonality in the ideology of these filmmakers. It never seems to fail that the one who commits the crime is the victim, and the ones who are victimized by the criminality are absolutely non-existent in their analysis of the situation. I'm not saying that disproportionate justice at the hands of an indifferent and often corrupt system isn't a very serious issue. I'm saying that it absolutely is, but from my experience, it seems that especially during these modern progressive times we find ourselves living in, people forget that the people most negatively impacted by crime are usually just as, if not even more so, in the toilet, socioeconomically speaking, than the criminals they're shouting themselves hoarse advocating for. As Arthur mentions later in the film, people have a natural inclination to want to go after the big fish at even the slightest provocation, because nobody wants to believe that they're entirely helpless under the heel of a bully who is much more powerful than they are. But let's not also lose sight of the fact that more often than not, criminals are bullies too. Regardless of the fact that it can never achieve perfect justice, whatever that means, the system is there to advocate for crime victims and the society that suffers from criminality in general. In other words, just like everything else in life that necessitates human involvement and all the infallibility that comes along with it, there's plenty of problems to consider on both sides of the issue. And like my recently deceased court-appointed AA sponsor always used to try and tell me for some reason, the first step towards fixing a problem is acknowledging that there's one that needs fixing in the first place. Now, I'm not sure why that was something he felt like he needed to tell me, but it seems to fit here quite nicely. So in other words, the movie has the courtesy to shit on the criminal justice system from two very different perspectives. One highlighting the pitfalls of a system of justice which emphasizes toughness on crime and following the letter of the law, and the other being a system of justice that focuses its efforts on rehabilitation and compassion when it comes to its application of the law. The former position is most reflected in Jeff McCullough and Ralph Aggie's tragic story threads, two obviously innocent, uh, uh individuals who are forced to rot in prison because of technical oversights, and the latter is represented by Jay's descent into madness when confronted with the knowledge that a man he had recently successfully defended on a murder beef decided to celebrate his newfound freedom by abducting two children and butchering them horribly. And I applaud the film for not taking the easy route by highlighting and attacking only the faulty elements of the legal system that would simply appeal to the lowest common denominator. What's more, the fact that the film appears to not want to placate its audience by offering ridiculous but romantic pie-in-the-sky solutions like OMG, seriously, let's just get rid of the lawyers, it just makes that phrase that nobody has to steal or whatever, which could only appeal to naive, entitled children and liberal arts majors, but I repeat myself, who never have and never will know just how brutal and abysmal a community rife with criminality can be. If some of the people here gave a good goddamn about the victimization of people in this community by crime, I take some of their invective more seriously. That's great. And that, in my opinion, is all the more to the film's credit. Another prominent theme jamming itself into your proverbial ribs throughout the film is how aesthetically cruel and inhuman the adversarial system of truth-finding can appear to be to, well, everybody. Now, for those of you not blessed as I've been with the tour de force of earning power that is the bachelor's degree in criminal justice, and therefore might not be familiar with the concept, the adversarial system that the United States uses to try and establish culpability is one that pits two opposing legal scholars against each other, that is, the prosecution and defense counsel, with a judge effectively serving as a referee to make sure that both sides are playing by the rules, and a jury of TikTok influencers and people who have voted more on American Idol than they have in American politics, whose sole civic constitutional obligation as an American citizen is determine which side was the cutest and the least most boring. Jury people. <gasps> 
To whatever degree the system is flawed, it's important to remember that it's because people are flawed. The system that works the best is the one that acknowledges the realities of the flaws working within it. When it comes to people, they, unlike our lead Kirkland, are generally motivated primarily by self-preservation, not altruism or humanitarianism, despite the fact that most of them like to think they are, and like to say they are even more than that. Well, you've done it. Congratulations on your soup success. You magnificent bastard. From the bottom of my heart, I truly hope you enjoy it, and that it can help you bring some happiness to those in your life who aren't an absolute pain in your balls. A couple of things I wanted to mention about the soup before we finish up with the movie, however, is that if you were interested in making it a bit more hearty and filling, adding a kind of pasta called dentalini is quite common. A few points on that though before you do. Make sure you cook the noodles in a separate pot so the noodles don't soak up more of the liquid in the soup than you want. Also, if you have leftovers, make sure you keep it separate from the soup so they don't get all swollen and soggy next time you want to tuck into it. Alright, let's wrap this turkey up. A car could have came by now. Hey, come on, you girls! We got dinner! What? What did he say? Is that English? What the adversarial system gets right is that it understands that most people are generally motivated to work hard when they are incentivized to win. And it's important to understand that that's not necessarily a dig at humanity. I mean, I am one after all, if not just barely. It's just a simple evolutionary observation. The winners get the princess, the money, the property, the food, and the resources. In other words, the winners stay alive and make other little winners with their winner partner who won you. And so it's been for ages, countless generations of people before you fought, conquered, and spawned others who fought, conquered, and spawned until here we are fighting our ISPs for higher data caps, conquering the last bits of Cheeto dust at the bottom of the bag, and spawn camping 12-year-olds in League of Legends because we had a rough day at the Cracker Factory. So that's it after 20 years. So long, good luck. I don't recall saying good luck. Like just about everything else that pulls so mightily on the strings of the human heart, anger and outrage generally compel people to attack and destroy what they perceive to be the source of their misery. Without asking difficult, introspective questions like, as bad as the faults of the institution I'm seeking to destroy are, is the alternative of destroying the institution and not having it at all going to make things even worse? Or even rarer is the question, can we replace the institution with something that rids us of the bad elements without eliminating the good ones as well. If you're into him, I consider Dostoevsky a particularly engaging storyteller for this exact reason. He took the most compelling arguments from both sides of an issue, taking every effort to acknowledge his own potential bias and dispel it as best he could from his writing, and let them have at each other. And what came forward was the best understanding of wherein lied the truth. This is no easy feat. But I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for the prosperity of a civilized society. The last thing I wanted to mention here is that the B story slash love interest might actually have the most compelling character arc in the film. The person who should have the most comprehensive handle on the system they've been ordained to oversee also happens to be the character in the story that's most detached from it. She's only forced to take a hard look at the institution for the first time when her romantic interest is saddled with the miserable position of either providing a zealous defense for his client, thereby allowing the adversarial system our best best attempt at the futile effort of coming to the truth, the opportunity to have its day, or making sure that a man is held responsible for a horrible crime he believes his client has committed. How things turn out, I'll leave that to you to see. Suffice it to say, the resolution to the film offers what I consider to be one of the most compelling and engaging monologues in motion picture history. It's written brilliantly and delivered masterfully by an Al Outrage Pacino that is absolutely at the top of his game. Well, first things first. If you find yourself enjoying the score, you're either disco stew or higher than my liver enzyme count. But having gotten that out of the way, I'm not going to lie to you here. The inconsistency in the tone of the film can be very off-putting in places. Without question, this film pushes the envelope in terms of what a dramedy can get away with while still allowing the audience to draw value from both genres. I suppose that's why I never liked movies that tried to juggle both in general. It's a lot like wanting to fuck your cake and eat it too. Yeah, sure, you could have both, but in the back of your mind, you're going to wonder if you wouldn't have had a better overall experience if you just focused your efforts on one over the other. Yeah, I found myself snickering at the humorous parts of the film, and I'm not saying there's no place for bits and pieces of comedy here and there in a serious drama, but when your film is going to inject slapstick that's farcical to the point that any semblance of suspension of disbelief on the part of your audience you might have been relying upon to get your point across promptly excuses itself right out the fucking window. 
Gentlemen, need I remind you you are in a court of law? You're going to have a mountain to climb trying to wrangle me back into emotionally investing myself into the more serious threads and themes in the film, as well as the characters whose fates are hinged upon how those situations resolve. When it comes to slapstick humor, there's an unspoken but no less important agreement that takes place between the filmmaker and the audience, which can be summed up as such. I will provide you with laughs, and you will let me provide them to you without having to invest the time and effort into structural elements of comedy like setup and payoff. In exchange, you have to allow yourself to completely dismiss the integrity and plausibility of the world I'm creating, as well as the stories I'm weaving inside of it. It was nothing, James. I was only doing it a small favor. Some retirement. I'm leaving, Frank. I never thought you'd go back on your work. Uh, aren't you being a little hasty? I don't think so. That should be the cab. If you need to, you could reach me at Louise's. Oh, Frank, how could you? I feel like I'm forgetting something back there. Destiny, Claire. That's it. We're here, Colt. Destiny, Claire, you're all right. And me too. In case you have the sensitivity to care. Unlike any movie I've ever seen before, or have seen since, and Justice for All flirts with the integrity of these two concepts to its detriment. Yeah, I think the film comes out on the better end of things, I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But I have to be honest and say that I think it does only in large part to some powerhouse performances, not the least of which coming from Pacino, of course, and some very savvy writing and compelling storytelling that managed to keep the film relatively grounded. <laughs> Also, I think it's important to point out that this film is incredibly busy, with several peripheral characters, each with their own unique problems and perspectives that revolve around Arthur in some way, and considering how many there actually are, as well as how impactful they very clearly aspire to be, they tie up somewhat nicely, with one or two possibly landing a bit heavy-handedly. <laughs> But let's be straight with each other. A Pacino movie without at least one over-the-top emotional outburst is a lot like a non-alcoholic beer. It's still possible to enjoy it on one level or another, but you also know that anyone who tries to convince you that they prefer it over the alternative is a disingenuous, self-righteous ass clown. Frankly, an unfortunate reality with this film, and a rather distracting one as a matter of fact, is that it seems to casually drift in and out of these two strikingly different genres of film at breakneck speed. And to be honest, I think I would be remiss without saying that while it's inarguably distracting at times, I simply can't help but appreciate certainly at this point in the history of film, the cinematic risk that it takes. My point is, assuming of course that I have one, is that the age of the spec script was dead a long time ago. And what that means for movies today is that they're either political propaganda or are about as entertaining as getting a root canal when all you want to do is get home so you can go balls deep into that freshly baked Lady Baltimore you left cooling off on the kitchen window. Well, we'll just tell your mother that, uh, that uh, we ate it all. And in either case, both films are coming from the laptops of career writers who are paid to shit out formulaic, safe, and inoffensive scripts and, most importantly, not take any chances on new, innovative material. Well, to put it mildly, and Justice for All does not fit into that category of film, and suffice it to say, the film is going to have its gaffes, and they're going to stand out like a humanities major at a Jordan Peterson lecture. As a matter of fact, it just so happens it contains what very well might be the most ostentatious and incongruous emotional and cinematic pivots in film history. I do call it a gripe, but it's also endearing, and I'm also happy that I can also call it just a gripe, because it's not a consistent problem throughout the film. It does, however, come at a very unfortunate time, which completely deflates any dramatic momentum the film had been building up to that point. I mean, it's bad. I won't spoil it here, but don't worry, you won't miss it. For context, however, imagine if at the end of Chinatown, which has one of the most emotionally devastating resolutions to be found anywhere in the history of film, as the credits start to roll, Yakety Sack starts playing as the background score. Don't trouble yourself to abstract the scene, dear viewer. I took the liberty for you. Uh, spoilers. Get away from her. Get away. She's mine, too. She's never going to know that. Evelyn, put that gun away. Let the police handle this. He owns the police. Halt. Forget it. 
Jake, it's Chinatown. Or if, say, after Oscar Schindler breaks down hysterically after considering how many more lives he could have saved if only he'd had the temerity to destroy his life even more than he'd already had, and and then one of the liberated Jews runs up behind him and smushes a fucking banana cream pie in his face. I did that too, so strap yourselves in and let's play the latest installment of Will Santino Have a YouTube Channel Tomorrow? I could have gone on to a person. And I didn't. I, I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> There's no question that this movie contains themes and depictions that would almost certainly make the shit list of goose stepping, book burning, progressive cry bullies the country over who would love nothing more than an opportunity to throw another piece of American art history on top of the pyre. So do yourself a favor and check it out while you still can, before they get wind of our happiness and work up the old number six on it. Well, that's where we go a riding into town, a whopping and a whopping, every living thing that moves within an inch of its life. But having said that, it brings up an interesting point about progress and how offensive expression fits into a civilized society, which I think is as important to understand today as it ever has been. Considering the ease with which it is these days to not only find a soapbox and stand on it for just about however long your audience is willing to tolerate it, coupled with the ease with which having your message accessible to just about anyone on the planet willing to listen to it is, without question the art of effective truth finding is more relevant today than it ever has been at any other point in human history. It's important it's important to allow people to be offensive and controversial, because problems by their very nature are offensive and controversial. And as much as we may revile the idea of coming face to face with our shortcomings, the fact of the matter is we'll never get the better of them unless we allow ourselves to be open to the idea of being offended by people with dissenting opinions. And just to wrap things up here, I would say considering the absolute deluge of unoriginal, self-indulging, and unfunny narrative-pushing dog shit that's been smearing itself across the silver screen as of late, you might be surprised at how refreshing it is to see a film that has the integrity to examine a complex and controversial issue through conflicting lenses. While it may be true that looking at it in such a way may blur the lines you had previously believed to objectively segregate right from wrong, but it's been my experience that, well, often that's where the truth resides, in the muck and the chaos and the discomfort of an honest-to-God, good-faith effort to empathize with those you disagree with. But then again, such endeavors often demand the utilization of such pillars of bigotry as hard work and humility which, these days, are concepts that are about as popular as a wet fart in a crowded phone booth. And to make sure we end things on a depressing note, it certainly sucks to consider that the people who need to hear that message the most are going to be the least likely to seek it out or to take it to heart should they ever happen to cross paths with it. Alright, that's it. Go ahead and let me know if you liked what you saw, and I'll do my best to get another one out if that's the case. But until that day... Until that day, then, huh? This is Santino Damani saying, Thank faith and Bogoro, we can at least still make fun of the Irish. And a fine job you did too.